good number of 35s. So welcome everybody to the MPC session of Asia Crip 2021. Once again, online, but close your hearts. And uh, I'm your co-chair, Bernardo David, and my other co-chair is Sofia Kubov. Maybe you can introduce yourself, Sofia. Uh, I think you did a great job introducing me. I'm Sofia. <laughs> Good, so let's get started with the first talk, which will be on homomorphic secret sharing for multipartite and general adversary structures supporting parallel evaluation of low degree polynomials. And uh, Reo Eriguchi will be giving the talk for us. Uh, please Reo, uh, share your screen and go ahead. Okay, uh, can you hear this slide? Yes, we can see your okay. screen and hear you just fine. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Reo Eriguchi. Uh, today, I talk about the paper titled uh, Homomorphic Secret Sharing for Multipartite and General Adversary Structures Supporting a Parallel Evaluation of Low Degree Polynomials. Uh, this is a joint work with Koji Nuida. Uh, homomorphic secret sharing um, uh, is an important building block for multiparty computation. Um, as in standard secret sharing, it has a sharing algorithm which takes a secret uh, X as input and outputs M shares. Then the privacy requirement is specified by the adversary structure delta, which is the collection of subsets A such that the shares in A uh, reveals no information on the secret X. Homomorphic secret sharing has additional algorithms uh, called evaluation and decryption algorithms. I suppose that um, N input players uh, generate M shares from their uh, private inputs and send them to M servers. Then uh, each server locally runs the evaluation algorithm on uh, function f and n shares it receives. Finally, um, an output player collects all the outputs of the evaluation algorithms from servers and runs the decryption algorithm, uh, whose output is supposed to be a value of the function f. In this work, uh, we consider three kinds of adversary structures. The, uh, uh, the first, the simplest case, is the threshold adversary structure, which um, to, uh, which uh, tolerates any collision of at most T servers. On the other hand, the most general case is a general adversary structure, which has no limitation on the adversary structure delta. Finally, a multiparted adversary structure lies between uh, threshold and general adversary structures. Uh, specifically, um, um, suppose that uh, the subset of M servers is partitioned into L parts, P1 to PL, uh, roughly speaking, uh, in a multi-party adversary structure, uh, whether a subset X is in delta or not is uniquely determined by this vector, which counts, which counts the number of servers in each part. Then, a multi-party adversary structures include various kinds of non-threshold adversary structures, such as weighted threshold, a hierarchical and compartmented adversary structures, and so on. Uh, there are several homophic secret sharing schemes for computing uh, polynomials um, uh, of degree d at most d. First, information theoretically secure schemes have been proposed for a threshold, a multipartite, and general adversary structures. Uh, however, their adversary structures must satisfy a condition called a type QD, which puts a strong limit on adversary's corruption power. On the other hand, there, there is the most powerful uh, homomorphic secret sharing scheme uh, tolerating the maximum corruption threshold. However, it must assume a um, narrow class of cryptographic assumptions um, related to lattices. Uh, recently, um, two schemes have been proposed, uh, which lie between these uh, two extreme cases. Uh, first, they can be obtained from a moderate assumption of homomorphic encryption for uh, degree k polynomials. Uh, second, um, they can tolerate a um, wider class of adversary structures than type QD. Um, the, the condition um, they, can, they must satisfy is uh, called type QDK. Uh, for example, in the threshold case, a type QDK means the threshold is uh, K plus one times larger than the upper bound of uh, type QD. Our work also followed that direction of research. Uh, first, uh, based on homomorphic encryption, we propose a novel homomorphic secret sharing scheme for multipartite adversary structures of type QDK. And the share size of our scheme is uh, only um, polynomial in the number of servers. So our scheme is more efficient than the previously known general construction uh, whose share size is exponential in M. Uh, 
Um, so furthermore, our scheme can tolerate a multi-parted advisory structure, so it is more general than the threshold scheme. In addition, we also show that the, uh, these homomorphic secret sharing schemes can be extended to homomorphic secret sharing for SIMD operation, which means that um, they can compute a single polynomial on L different inputs uh, simultaneously. And the overhead in our share size is only logarithmic in L, so it is um, more efficient than the naive solution of simply running L computations independently, which results in an overhead proportional to L. As a drawback, however, our, the adversary structure of our scheme must satisfy a stronger condition, which we call type QD KL. But it is still wider than the informational theoretic bound of type QD. Uh, technically, we use the notion of packed secret sharing scheme. For example, um, the previous scheme can tolerate a general adversary structure, but does not um, support parallel evaluation. On the other hand, the, pack, uh, the, sh the share size of packed sec secret sharing scheme is only logarithmic in uh, um, the number of evaluations. However, it, uh, it can only tolerate a threshold adversary structure. In this work, we propose a novel way to combine these two schemes. And as a result, uh, we obtain a homomorphic secret sharing, uh, which not only tolerates general adversary structures, but also uh, achieve share size logarithmic in the number of evaluations. Uh, this is the end of my talk. Uh, please see here uh, for the details. That's all, thank you. Thanks, Rio, for a talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Please remember you can ask questions on Zulip on the link that Kevin posted on the chat here, or uh, feel free to unmute and ask your questions on, on Zoom right now. So there doesn't seem to be anything on Zulip. Yeah. Uh, so let's thank uh, Rio again uh, for his talk. And, I'd like to, to ask one, uh, one question here. You mentioned that uh, there were previous constructions based on uh, strong, uh, stronger um, assumptions. Yeah. And, then, and then now you have a, a weaker uh, uh, type QDKL class, but yeah. you can get security assuming K uh, homomorphic encryption. What class of assumptions can you build that uh, primitive from? Oh, uh, homomorphic, um, our scheme can be obtained from um, any homomorphic encryption scheme. So uh, homomorphic secret sharing, a homomorphic encryption can be obtained from um, several uh, cryptographic assumptions such as um, uh, Diffie-Hellman um, in addition to all, all lattice, lattices. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so it generalizes to both lattice space and number theoretical uh, assumption classes. That's uh, that's interesting. Um, do you have anyone has any other questions? So if you have any further questions, you can always uh, use Zulip, and uh, I would ask all of the presenters to keep an eye there and answer anything that might come up later. Let's uh, proceed to the next presentation. Thanks again, Rio. Uh, I would like to proceed now to the presentation on improved single round secure multiplication using regenerating cults, a paper by Mark Atspol, Ronald Kramer, Ivan Damgo, Daniel Escudero, and Chao Ping Xing. And Daniel will be presenting for us. Uh, please share your screen and uh, you're welcome to start anytime you want. Yeah, hello, thank you so much for the introduction. So you all hear me fine, correct? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction, Bernardo. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is, is, is Daniel, and I'm going to talk about this paper with Mark Abspol, Ronald Kramer, Ivan Dangard, and Chao Pinxing. So um, first, let me uh, mention what our setting is. We have a multi-party computation with n parties. We, have a, we, we label them by P1 up to Pn. And we assume that we have two corruptions where n is going to be to t plus one, so is the honest majority setting with the maximum corruption threshold. And we're going to use a brackets with a subscript d to denote basically linear secret sharing scheme with threshold d. And the problem that we're considering in this work is basically secure multiplication. So given two secret shared inputs, x and y, 
how to obtain shares of the product, X and Y. And this is an example of a very typical uh, multiplication protocol. If you have a um, share triple, A, B, and the product of A, B, where A and B are random, then the parties could execute the following. So basically, uh, take the shares of X, subtract A, and then they obtain uh, some value D. Similarly, they obtain some value E by masking, masking Y. And then they're going to reconstruct uh, these values D and these values E, and then they take certain affine combination that can be checked, the results in the shares of the product. But the point is that they need to reconstruct in this process. So for the reconstruction, they have two options. Uh, so one can be that all parties send shares to each other, but in this case, the communication complexity will be quadratic in the number of parties because everyone talks to everyone. Uh, but the good thing is that it will have only one round. And on the other hand, if all parties instead send shares to one single party, let's say P1, this party reconstructs a secret and then sends the result back, then the communication complexity will be linear now, but it will have two rounds. So the question that we explored is whether or not we can achieve secure multiplication using only one round with a communication complexity that is strictly better than n squared. And unfortunately, we cannot give a full answer. We cannot either provide a, an impossibility result because like yeah, the problem actually seems quite challenging. If you need openings during the multiplication protocol, then it's true that you will go to n square, but maybe there are other approaches that will get you seven square. But we have a partial result towards this, which is that there exists a protocol to securely evaluate not one secure multiplication, but, but many secure multiplications, or, or at least a batch of them that depends on the number of parties, where the communication complexity of each one of those multiplications, like when you amortize or divide by the number of multiplications, it is sub n square. In the, the true communication becomes sub n square. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a bonus, of, uh, our protocol also works for Galois rings, which are generalization of finite fields and also integers modulo powers of a prime. And another interesting thing is that we are, um, we can be seen at the first work making use of regenerating codes in the context of MPC uh, explicitly. So these tools are very useful or seem very useful for helping uh, you know, optimizing reconstruction, but it was quite hard to find out like a concrete application for them. So just to give you an idea about how this result is obtained, consider the existence of regenerating codes studied in this work by Gurswami and Wouters in stock 2016. So if we have, a, it, it, this result says that if we have a shared value X, uh, basically you can find linear functions that take big vectors or big values and turn it into small values and certain scalars such that this linear combination here, uh, when you take all these compressed shares and multiply them by the scalars, then you're gonna reconstruct the secret. So basically you can reconstruct the secret by sending smaller shares. So if you want to reconstruct the share value X in one round, you can, instead of using the full shares, you can use the small shares and, and compute the appropriate linear combination. And now the communication complexity will be n squared, but if you count the number of elements in terms of the elements in F2, then basically this brings you down to sublinear n squared. But this is just the start of the story. Several problems will appear. So I'm just gonna close over uh, them very quickly, but at least give you the idea of some of the challenges. So the first challenge is that you definitely don't want to have multiplication over F2 to the M because uh, in the previous slide, I had that M is about log N. So this structure is gonna grow with the number of parties and you would like to have something that, that is constant for the computation. And for this, we can use reverse multiplication friendly embeddings and introduce a crypto 18. But doing this naively will not work because the techniques from this work that I just cited, CCXY18, will not work in our, in our setting because they will add an extra round. So in our paper, we introduce a novel encoding mechanism that also might be of independent interest that will improve this paper in several aspects, including reducing this extra round. Also, we have problems with our active adversaries, and we also show how to address this using uh, the pre-processing from turbo speeds, but instead of using for communication improvements, we use it for security purposes. 
I'm not giving details. Uh, of course, I encourage you to go and check the paper and the full video to, to see how this is done. And finally, uh, RMFE is over Galois rings because everything I have said so far is for finite fields. So RMFE is over Galois rings. We do have them. They do exist. Uh, but we generalize the theory of regenerating codes to this setting. And we actually give a new characterization of the concept of repairability in terms of the dual code. The previous characterizations did not, um, did not have these, uh, these, did not look like this. And then we give concrete instantiations over color rings, which is the case of interest for us. And that would be my five minute talk. Thank you. Thanks for the talk, Daniel. Uh, do we have any questions? I don't see anything on Zulip yet. Uh, if anyone would like to ask a question by audio, please go ahead. I see a raised hand here from Sophia, or is that a clapping no, that's hand? No, that's applause. It's a clapping hand. Oh, nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, I actually have a question. I, I, I see that clearly it's a more theoretically oriented result and quite an interesting one, but uh, is there any hope that the constants hidden in all of the asymptotic notation are actually nice enough that we could apply these techniques to concrete settings or uh, is it still in a, in, a, in a purely theoretical setting? So this question, in terms of, in terms of constants, the constants are actually quite nice. Like uh, when you see this thing here, the constants that will appear here basically come from uh, the RMFE, the reverse multiplication field embedding we use. And the overhead of this thing will be something like between four and five. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's not really that bad. What I think is not that practical is that, I mean, this is sub n squared, but, but in reality is this number here, which is n squared divided by log n. So I think we break the barrier of the n squared, but if you have two protocols, one takes two rounds and it's linear communication complexity. One, the other one takes one round and it's almost quadratic, it's sub quadratic, but almost quadratic. So it's probably more efficient to use the, the linear one. But we hope that we can keep solving this problem and bring down the complexity of one round multiplication, hopefully to linear. Although I have no idea how to achieve this. So I think this is a very interesting result because it breaks the barrier, but I don't know how to get it more efficient. Well, thanks for the answer. And let's thank uh, Daniel again for uh, his presentation. We'll now proceed to the next presentation on garbling, stacked, and staggered faster K out of N garbled function evaluation, a paper by David Heath, Vlad Kolesnikov, and Stanislav Pecheny. I guess it is Stanislav who is presenting for us. Uh, please go ahead and share your screen and feel free to start your presentation. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can hear you just fine and see your screen. Perfect. So uh, thank you again. Uh, I will talk about our paper, Garbling Stuck and Staggered, Faster k out of n Garbled Function Evaluation. And this is joint work with David Heath and Vlad Kolesnikov, and we work at Georgia Tech. So now consider a server, and this server offers a suite of services to clients and uh, suppose that these services have privacy concerns for both the server and the client. And as an example, suppose that a telehealth company offers services that screen concerned patients for a variety of medical conditions represented as function zero through n minus one. And the patient may a priori know that a number of medical conditions are unlikely to be the source of her symptoms. So the patient may only wish to be screened for K health conditions out of the possible N. So the patient really wants to evaluate K out of N public functions to which the patient has some private inputs. So I emphasize that the patient knows which K functions she wants to evaluate and in this talk, I present our K out of N construction and this construction yields a significant concrete improvement over the state of the art constructions. So the construction is garbled circuit based. And I repeat that in our construction, Alice's K choices are known to her. 
I will start by presenting why a naive garbage circuit solution to the Kaudovan problem is not satisfactory. And an important point is that the garbler should not know nor learn which case circuits Alice will evaluate. So he garbles all n circuits, compiles them into a single string, and sends this string across the wire to Alice. And I emphasize that the sending of the circuit garblings, which I will refer to as the material, is expensive. In fact, uh, this process of sending the material is traditionally considered the most expensive part of the garbled circuit protocol. But in crypto 2020, David Heath and Vlad Kolesnikov introduced start garbling, which reduces precisely this bandwidth consumption for one out of n circuits. And this work showed that it is not necessary to send a garbling for each of the n circuits. In fact, it suffices to send a single material of length equal to the single longest garbling among the n circuits. And while it is communication that has been traditionally viewed as the garbled circuit bottleneck, start garbling really changed the status quo and uh, garbling itself consumes significant computational resources. Uh, and in many settings, it is now computation that becomes the bottleneck. So the start garbling technique can be generalized, generalized to arbitrary K. And while the communication improvement is preserved, that is the communication cost is proportional to K rather than N, naively extending this technique to K out of N circuit incurs factor K increase in computation. So meaning the computation grows with K. So there seems to be an inherent trade-off between computation and communication with the current techniques. So start garbling reduces communication consumption, but it also increases computation consumption. And this trade-off forces us to cho choose between either communication and computation, which is not desirable. So in our work, we ask whether we can have the best of both worlds. That is, can we pay communication only for K materials and still incur computation on the order of N? And we answer in the affirmative. And central to our idea is the fact that material is viewed differently in each technique. So in the garbled circuit, traditionally, uh, material was viewed as a collection of encrypted truth tables. The key idea of start garbling was that the material should instead be viewed as a bit string. And this idea enabled to manage these materials with natural operations such as bitwise XOR. And we take this idea further and instead view the material as an element in a large Galois field. And as a result, we can perform linear algebraic operations on the material. So I will now very briefly present the three constructions at a high level and on a small example where n equals three and k equals two. So again, in the Yao's garbled circuit, the garbled garbles all three circuits, concatenates them into one string and sends the string across the wire to Alice. In start garbling, instead of sending M0, M1, and M2 separately, the garble adds these three values together using XOR. And here is where we have one in terms of communication because we do not send M0, M1, and M2 separately, but instead send their sum. And then importantly, Alice needs to be able to unstack the taken materials. Start garbling describes how this can be securely and efficiently achieved. Uh, I will not get into it at this moment, but since k equals two, we need two stacks. So note that the material in stack one, uh, th those materials are different from those in stack zero, although they represent the same functions. And this is exactly where the computation cost proportional to k times and garbling comes in, as n new materials are needed for each of the k stack. Instead, we would like to reuse the same n materials across the stacks, which is precisely what we achieve in our stack and staggered construction. And in this slide, I show the two stacks in our stack and staggered construction. Note that M0, M1, and M2 are same across the stacks. That is, there is a total of N materials. And while stack zero is the same as in the stack garbling approach, the materials in stack one are multiplied 
by our powers of two before they're added together. And now it should be believable that this multiplication provides some additional information that will enable Alice to bit by bit unstack the taken materials. And since we view the materials as elements in a Galois field, we can multiply them by these different powers of two, which simply adds zeros and shifts each material within the stack. This means we can pick our linear algebraic operation such that everything can be implemented with simple bitwise XOR, and hence we obtain high performance. We, shift we simply shift each material and XOR it into a stack. And these simple stacking operations are far cheaper than the garbling operations. As a result, we obtain performance that matches computation of the standard Yaws garbled circuit approach and communication of start garbling. And in summary, so the key contribution is that we improve garbled circuit evaluation of K out of N functions where the K choices are known to the garbled circuit evaluator. We retain the start garbling communication complexity while simultaneously retain the computation complexity of standard uh, garbled circuit approach. Uh, and thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks for our presentation, Stan. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I would ask you to actually put it on Zulip because we are almost out of time for this lot. So uh, I will actually ask that we proceed to the next uh, presentation and then uh, please leave your questions on Zulip and I'll ask uh, Stan to also <laughs> watch Zulip and answer anything that might come up. Our next presentation is on better security efficiency trade-offs in permutation based to party computation, a paper by Yu Long Chen and Stefano Tesaro. And the presentation will be given by you. So please uh, share your screen and start the presentation when you're ready, you. Um, hello, so can you see the slide? Uh, no, oh. we can see ah. your face, but... Uh... Uh, sorry, uh, let me try it again. Um... Okay. Now I hope that uh, you can see the slide. Yes, uh, we can see the slides. Just <laughs> okay, fine. thank you. So this joint work uh, with Stefano De Salo. Um, so as you yeah, already heard from the last three pre um, presentations, that multi-party computation is one of the hottest topic at this moment. But do you also know that um, Protocols such as OT extension schemes and garbled circuit actually make have happy use of symmetric key primitives. So that means this talk is actually uh, more about the primitives that are actually used in the protocol instead of the protocols itself. Um, so actually one of the common denominator in those protocols is actually a special form of hash functions. And this type of hash functions is um, often the model as a random oracle, but um, yeah, um, also um, yeah, used to hash 128-bit strings. That means that uh, um, the traditional SHA-3 hash function is too large for um, this type of applications because SHA-3 um, has a large state size that will lead to low performance. And that's the reason why currently constructions based on fixed key AS um, are used to improve the performance. However, the big problem here is that uh, many of the existing protocols actually use an inefficient and sometimes even insecure hash functions. So the fact that those insecure hash functions are used means that um, the protocols just yeah, don't, ex um, don't and get the uh, claim to security. So that means the protocols will be insecure with those insecure hash functions. So, and besides that, there are several notions needed for different types of protocols. And that makes that we need different constructions in order to satisfy a stronger version of the notions. 
uh, maybe one explanation about why this problem is hard. What we want here is something that's called correlation robustness. But that means, um, yeah, you can find it back in the full version of the presentation um, on YouTube. So keep in mind that we are dealing with something that's called a hash function. So hash function means that no designated secret key input. That means that here the only randomness comes together with the message inputs, and there's nothing we can change about it. And we can not just obtain this type of hash function from a traditional symmetry key primitive such as a tweakable block cipher. This problem is, however, related to a, a classical um, symmetry key problem, which is a related key security for XOR. So um, the first yeah, secure trickball and um, trickball correlation robustness hash function was actually this trickball MMO construction proposed in SMP in um, by Do et al in yeah, last year. So we can see that the construction makes two permutation calls to uh, public um, to a public permutation, and then we can see that the security achieved by this um, construction is this type of typical birthday bond of security, which um, P is the number of the evaluation to the underlying primitive um, yeah, permutation, and Q is the number of evaluation to the entire construction. And um, the, pr um, the problem here is that this construction, so this um, yeah, was showed by this, um, yeah, one of the follow-up work by the same authors, or more or less the same authors, and it's, crypto last year that, um, that security achieved by this construction is actually inefficient when the newly used security is considered. The reason therefore is that um, P is usually a very large number. And now the fact that we consider the newly user case, Q become, um, also become large. So while the second term is still um, not so important for the practical applications, the, the first term is very, um, yeah, I would say, it will be very painful for the um, for the practical applications due to the new usage and security and setting. So the authors also introduced the following construction, which just make one call to an ideal cipher. Here, this tweak T serves as um, yeah, the yeah, the input key for this ideal cipher. We can see this is a bond that's achieved by this construction, and here B is actually the number of um, um and the uh, construction queries per um, yeah, per same tweak. And this B, you just need to remember that B is usually a very small number for OT and garbage circuits. And um, yeah, because this change and this uh, security bonds, the construction is very and um, provides sufficient security for the multi-user setting. But the uh, limitation of the construction is that this um, construction um, makes the uh, assumption that the ideal cipher and exists in practice, which is too strong assumption for practice. Um, for example, assumptions like random oracles, but it was also broken by, um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. for example, in those um, MD5 constructions or something like that. And so ideal cyber construction is actually something that's more or less um, from the same level. So that's the reason why we start again. So the main contribution in this work is um, the following construction that actually makes um, again two permutation calls to a pi one. And so one permutation call to pi one and one permutation call to pi two. And this construction is called the feed forward permutation to permutation of or the FPDP construction. You see that this construction looks very similar to that previous. Um, yeah, PMMO construction, but the only difference now is that instead of um, feed forward from the output of this um, first permutation, we feed forward here the input. So this small modification makes a big improvement. While the second term is still the same, which is not important for the um, OT and scalpel circuits applications, the first term improves for um, a, a factor of uh, square root of Q. And see again, B is very small for an um, OT and covered circuit, and is equal to the number of construction queries per tweak. And so we do request those um, tweak T's are chosen from nice combinatorial subsets, for example, a random subsets. We can show that we can, um, we also present um, yeah, um, yeah, a small OT protocol in our paper that we can do that a priori 
and fix the uh, tricks. Um, so we proved the security for distinct and uniform random messages, and but the same result can also hold for arbitrary input message M if we replace M by um, this. And uh, finite truth multiplication with the three T. So just introducing one extra finite truth multiplication, we can get a much better result. And we prove um, the results saying um, both for independent pi one and pi two, also in the case when pi one is equal to pi two. Both cases and um, the construction achieves this security bond. And um, just because this improvement of square root of Q makes this, um, the construction sufficient for the multi-user setting. So this is uh, um, yeah, the end of my presentation. And um, more, about, more details about that, you can find it um, in, the, in the full version of this paper or um, just on, the, um, on my um, full both version of the talk on ePrint. So um, thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for your presentation, you. Uh, do we have any quick questions? Looks like uh, we also have silence on Zulip. So I have one quick question. Uh, I saw that you have uh, some uh, analysis, some self-contained analysis of OT extensions. Um, could you get a similar efficiency, concrete efficiency, as the constructions that are based on just using AES with a fixed key or something like that? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question because we, I, I discussed with my go off about that. So, um, so actually what can be done is instead of um, implementing um, this Pi1 and Pi2 as a real um, permutation, we can also choose, for example, to implement this um, Pi1 as um, the first five front of a, um, fixed key AES and this Pi2 as the second five front of AES. But I also talked with uh, a colleague uh, who is doing symmetric key analysis. Um, yeah, he told me probably uh, we need more rounds for this, for example, um, six or seven rounds for each. But um, in that case, I think um, there are re uh, really the real crypt analysis needed for this um, construction to make sure we do not use two less rounds and make the, um, yeah, the underlying primitive actually insecure. So that's actually my opinion, but that's probably something for the future work. Okay, uh, thanks for the answer and thanks again for your presentation. So now let's move on to our next presentation. That's going to be about two round adaptively secure MPC from Isogenies, LPN or CDH, which is a work by Navid Alamati, Hart Montgomery, Sikar Patranabis and Pratik Sarkar. Uh, the talk will be given by Pratik uh, who has already shared his screen. So please go ahead whenever you're ready. Hello, <clears throat> hi everyone. So my name is Pratik and today we are gonna talk about uh, two round adaptively secure MPC from Isogenes, LPN, or CDH. So this is a joint work with Navid, Hart, and Shikhar. So today we are gonna to talk about secure competition. I will consider the two-party setting. So there is a party Bob and there's a party Alice. They have private inputs X and Y. So they want to compute a function F on their private input X and Y. So the parties compute the protocol, which is pi, and they output the protocol output, which is pi of X comma Y. So the Protocol should satisfy two properties. First is correctness. Function output should be same as protocol output and security. Uh, the pi should not leak anything about the private witness. Uh, okay. So, and uh, yeah, so the, uh, the first few protocols for 2PC were presented by Yao, Goldreich Mikali and Beaver Mikali Rogovic. And this uh, thing, um, uh, 2PC has applications in privacy preserving machine learning and blockchains. So today we are gonna talk about OT. So it's a very simple primitive. There's a receiver and sender. So the receiver has inputs V and MB, I mean B, and the sender has inputs M0, M1, and the receiver obtains MB as output. So the receiver should not know what is M1 minus B, and the sender should not know what is B. And so this primitive of OT is complete for secure computation. And we also know that round optimal OT enables round optimal secure computation. It also has other uh, applications like private set intersection and interactive zero knowledge. Uh, but in this work, we aim for uh, constructing 
adaptively secure OTs, which are secured against malicious corruption of parties. And we aim to achieve UC security. And this is the strongest corruption model and the strongest security model in MPC. So let us briefly focus on the uh, literature of adaptively secured MPC. So we are going to talk about non erasure models where the party. Okay. So in the adaptive setting, the parties can get corrupted during after or beginning of the protocol at any time during the protocol execution. So it's a very strong model. And here the simulator needs to uh, simulate the view of the party, uh, even when the parties are corrupted uh, during the protocol. So we consider the non erasure model uh, where the simulator cannot erase the states of the parties. So in this work, it was shown by Gerg and Sai that you cannot obtain um, a constant round MPC protocol in the plane model with black box simulation. So that's why uh, there are two works uh, which construct from non black box simulation techniques. Uh, they construct constant round MPC protocol. So this, the second work is going to be the next talk given by Mac. And in the setup string model, uh, there were a few, a few works uh, which constructed linear round protocols starting from the work of uh, CLOS. Uh, and then uh, the work by Hazai and um, Motu, they constructed the first constant round protocol from public key encryption with oblivious ciphertext generation. Um, so that is the minimal assumption required. And now uh, let us focus on the two round setting. So we know that two round MPC is round optimal in the CRS model. So in this model, uh, there were a uh, few works in from IO uh, starting from uh, the CGP and GP uh, 15 papers. And then uh, the work by Behen Muda et al constructed the first two round adaptively secured MPC uh, from standard assumptions like DDH, LWE and QR without IO in the common reference string model. And in another work, um, we constructed um, adaptively secured MPC from DDH in CRS model, in common random string model. So let me uh, go through our contributions. So in this work, we show that uh, we can construct adaptively secured MPC from a very weak primitive called RIOT in the CRS model. I will define RIOT in the next slide. And then we constructed RIOT from CDH, LPN and isogeny, isogenies in the CRS model. So these were not known. And uh, as a result, we obtained the first two round malicious adaptively secured MPC from CDH, LPN and isogenies in CRS model. And as a side result, we also construct the first non-committing encryption scheme from LPN. So I will just briefly go through the results. Uh, so let me first define what is RIOT. So it's an IOT. IOT is, is a uh, indistinguishability based security OT protocol that uh, is secured against static malicious corruptions. RIOT just adds a, a sampling property where the receiver's OT protocol message can be obliviously sampled. So we show that uh, using this RIOT and a bunch of primitives, you can construct RSIOT. So in RSIOT, you can also obliviously sample a sender's OT protocol message. That is, uh, yeah. And then you can construct these primitives from one-way functions. Next, we show that uh, from RSIOT, you can build something called semi-adaptive OT, which is like a, a, a intermediate step to adaptive secured MPC. Then again, we show that from RSIOT, you can obtain something called trapdo similar double PKE. And using the result of CDMW, you can get augmented NCE. So um, using just RIOT, you can get till NCE. And then by applying the result of uh, Ben Muda et al, uh, we obtain adaptive secure MPC. And finally, we show that you can construct RIOT from CDH, LPN, or group actions. And that's all. So concluding, we construct uh, the first two round malicious secure adaptive uh, MPC from RIOT. So to end with two open questions, uh, what is the minimal assumption required for this RIOT primitive? Uh, and what is the minimal assumption in general required for two round adaptively secure uh, MPC protocol? Uh, thank you. Thanks for your presentation, Pratik. Do we have any questions? Oh, 
Okay, uh, I do have a question uh, here. Uh, what is the relationship between uh, IoT or RIoT or ISIoT and say standard UC secure OT? Can you compile from one to, to, to the other or do you need more tools? Right. Uh, so uh, UC OT is stronger, but in this work, uh, because you need simulation extractability, right? I mean, you need to extract the party's inputs. Uh, so the work by Ben Muda et al, they actually started off with UCOT, and that's why you cannot um, build that from uh, LPN. Uh, like they start, they require they started off with UCOT with some sampling properties, and that's why you cannot build it from uh, LPN, CDH, or isogenies. So that's why we reduced it to this RIOT primitive, which is game based definition, along with some receivers ampliability property. So essentially, we show that uh, these two are equivalent. RIOT implies UC or adaptively secure UCOT in that sense. Like our work shows that, right? Ah, okay. That, that, that was uh, basically my yeah. question. Uh, thanks. Uh, do we have any, any other questions? So thanks again, Pratik, for a presentation. And we will proceed to the final uh, presentation of the session on reverse firewalls for adaptively secure MPC without setup. That's a paper by Suvradeep Chakraborty, Chaya Ganesh, Mahak Pancholi, and Pratik Sarkar again. Uh, but this presentation will be given by Mahak. So please, yeah. Mahak, share your screen and uh, start whenever you're ready. Um, just a second. Can you see this? Yes, uh, we can see your screen. Okay. Although we can so, see the the bar on top. I don't know if you can maximize the slides. Uh, it's okay um, though. Yeah, don't worry. We can we can see the slides. Uh, it's just a minor detail. We can see the slides just fine. Just just go ahead. Okay. Well. Hi again, I'm going to talk about reverse firewalls for adaptively secure MPC without setup. Um, let me first talk about MPC in the classical setting. So suppose there are two parties, Charlie and Lucy, and they want to compute a function f on their inputs x1 and x2, uh, and they want to do it securely. By securely, we mean that Lucy, who is corrupt here, should only learn about the output and nothing else about Charlie's input. So in classical setting, Charlie and Lucy would run some secure 2PC protocol and exchange some round messages. And towards the end, they would be able to learn uh, f of x1 and x2. And in this process, the guarantee is that Lucy will not learn anything about Charlie's input, except for whatever is revealed from the function output itself. But it is important to note that the security guarantee crucially relies on the assumption that the honest parties execute the protocol honestly. That is, Charlie's computer has honest implementation of the protocol. But what if this assumption is not valid? So in this work, we consider, uh, again, Lucy is corrupt here, but now we think of Charlie having a uh, tampered implementation. So this, this, this machine is tampered by the adversary before Charlie gets to own it. So what can happen in this case is that instead of sending the correct message prescribed by the protocol, a tampered implementation can just output some secrets. And so there is no privacy. And this type of leakage is called exfiltration. Um, but note that a tampering is slightly different from an actual corruption here. Uh, the adversary tampers a machine in the beginning, and once it's owned by Charlie, the adversary cannot arbitrarily control or see the internal state of the machine. So the question we ask in this work is, can we design an MPC protocol such that we get some meaningful notion of security, even when the machines of honest parties are tampered by the adversary? In general, the answer is no. But with few assumptions, we do get positive results. 
In particular, uh, in this work, we assume cryptographic reverse firewalls, or RFs. Um, once again, Charlie's implementation is tampered here. But now there is a firewall, which is a piece of code that sits between the implementation and the outside world. And its job is to sanitize all incoming and outgoing messages so that nothing important is leaked. We want that the uh, RF preserves the security notion of the underlying MBC protocol. And this is called security preserving or SP. Um, and we want it to prevent the tampering from leaking any sorts of secrets, which is called exfiltration resistant. And one of the objectives while designing the RFs is to keep its operations very, very simple so that the code can be tested and verified before using it. Moreover, it's not like we're shifting our trust to the RF, as we do not allow the RF to hold any of Charlie's secrets. Um, let me talk a little bit about the previous results before I talk about our contributions. So this notion was introduced by Mirnov et al. in Eurocrypt 2015. Uh, and in their work, they gave a construction for a two PC protocol along with the RF that is secure even in the face of tampering. However, the construction works only for passive and static corruptions, where passive corruptions means the corrupted party uh, corrupted parties need to follow the protocol, but try to learn something extra from the transcript. And static corruptions means that the adversary corrupts the parties at the beginning of the protocol execution. Then Chakraborty et al. Uh, extended this result to multi-party setting and to active corruptions, where active corruptions means that the corrupted parties can now uh, arbitra behave arbitrarily, arbitrarily and not follow the protocol. However, this um, construction assumes a, a common reference string or a CRS, and that is a setup assumption. Um, so in this work, we, ex we further strengthen the result to active and adaptive corruptions, where adaptive corruptions means that the adversary can now corrupt honest parties even during the protocol execution. And moreover, we remove the assumption on CRS, and our final construction is an, in the plain model. Uh, finally, to summarize our results, we introduced new definitions for the adaptive case uh, because the older definitions did not suffice for this setting. We give a new implication for uh, between exfiltration resistance and security preservation. And this is a very interesting result because uh, the prior works conjectured that these two results, these two notions might not be related, but we show that they indeed are for simulation-based security. And as mentioned, uh, we give a new construction that is secure against adaptive and active adversary and secure even when honest parties machines are tampered. Um, thank you. And you can find more uh, details on our paper, which is on the ePrint and um, on the extended talk. Thanks for your talk, Mark. Uh, do we have any questions? If someone wants to ask questions on audio, please open your microphones. Otherwise, we do have Zulip that is looking a bit silent right now. So I'll start with a, with a question. Maybe it was my misunderstanding or maybe we even talked about it, but I'm not clear on whether the adaptive adversary is allowed to adaptively tamper with the honest party's machine after the execution has started or not. Uh, so what is the case? It is uh, it is adaptive corruption. So the uh, in the beginning, the uh, the adversary would have tampered honest parties, but later during execution, it can uh, corrupt these already tampered parties also. In which case, it would uh, start controlling the parties from that point onwards. But we would want uh, that before this corruption happens, nothing is revealed. We don't really we don't say much about what happens after corruption. Okay. Uh, and but, what tools do you need to build these uh, reverse firewalls for this very strong case of uh, adaptively secure MPC? Can you build it from the same kind of tools you use for adaptively secure MPC, like non communion encryption and so on, adaptively secure OT, or do you need something else for the... So we do use some of the standard tools. We use an adaptively secure uh, commitment scheme. Um, and we, so, so we, our general construction is it follows GMW uh, compiler approach. 
And so all the building blocks, the commitment scheme, the zero knowledge uh, protocol that we use, all of them have to be adaptively secure. Uh, but finally, to make it uh, work in plain model, we do we do assume knowledge assumptions. Okay, thanks for the, the explanation. Uh, do we have any any more questions? So I'd like to thank Mahak again. And uh, now, since we have three remaining minutes, I'd like to open the floor to anyone who would like to ask any questions about any of the the presentations we had. I guess not. So finally, I'd like to thank all of the presenters and all of the authors of the papers in the session. And of course, also thank you all who attended our session. And a special thanks to Kevin McCurley, who once again helped us set up the whole uh, infrastructure for these online conferences. Thank you all. And I hope to see you later in the social hour and in the remaining days of Asia Crypt 2021. Have a good day. And I bye believe bye. the social hour is starting in two minutes. So if you haven't noticed in the program, there are four different rooms for four different languages. Hopefully that covers the whole spectrum of necessary languages. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the rooms are hosted by people who speak those languages. So I invite you to go and mingle with some of your other cryptographer friends. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.